And we are live. Hi everyone, welcome back to another um, session with Fresh Gentle Shadowing. Today we have um, Dr. Baj with us and he'll start his presentation whenever he's ready. Hi guys, <clears throat> my name is Hamza Gaj. Um, I am a dentist currently practicing in Austin, Texas. Um, I have been a dentist since 2018, graduated from Midwestern in Chicago. And um, yeah, I'm practicing general dentistry at a private practice now, and I love it. Um, so I know you guys have probably gone through a lot of like technical and clinical aspects of dentistry, and I just want to kind of like give you a little mental break and focus on mental health in dentistry and how important that is. And I do have a case too, just because I know you guys technically wanted to shadow, so I went over that. Um, but yeah, we'll go ahead to the next slide. <clears throat> I'm not connected to it, so I'm going to be asking our lovely host to help out. So thanks for that. Um, so yeah, I already mentioned that. That's me. Um, so mental health and dentistry, just like in general, like the concepts I'm going to be covering and I might repeat it again. It's the first thing that's like most important from starting out in dental school is choosing the right one for you. So when I did apply, I didn't get in the first time, um, I reapplied. And when I did reapply, I did get options, you know, after that. And I had this trouble trying to figure out what school was right for me. And um, the thing I realized is like at the end of the day, all of the schools are great schools. Like there's no difference in quality. Each school has like a different pro to offer. And, you know, they all have their pros and cons, but at the end of the day, you're going to get the same degree that you can apply to any aspect of dentistry. Um, so for me, what was important was the, where I was going to live. So I ended up picking Chicago because I always loved the city of Chicago. Like I grew up watching movies and I really was obsessed with the idea of like living in a city like that one day and just like experiencing it. And for four years to experience Chicago was like the best decision I made and I don't regret it at all. Um, Obviously, the other factors you have to take into account is like, is the is the clinical setting right for you? Do you feel like comfortable in that setting? Do you like the faculty that you've met? Um, do you feel like the overall principles of the school align with yours? Because, you know, some schools are more old school and some have newer tech. So like my school had the newer technology and I'm very into tech. So for me, that was another big fit. Um and yeah, so just that's one thing I want you to consider, you know, like if you do have options, don't rush into like the first school you get uh, an offer from. Try to take your time and kind of take everything into account and don't rush unless, you know, you have no choice. Um, but yeah, I mean, in-state school is always the best option because it's cheaper overall. But like if you want to live in another city and experience that city for a couple of years, like, yeah, I mean, you'll pay extra, but nothing beats like having that experience because who knows once you start working when you'll get that experience again in your life right um and it, it just rounds you like i have so many patients now that are from other cities like and when i do have patients from chicago or the midwest it's always nice to connect with them on that regard and it's like an additional thing that really reflects on your chair time uh, etiquette with patients that they really appreciate um so the next thing i was going to go over is just uh reflection and that's just the main principle of Every time you go through certain things through your pre-dental career, just take a moment to reflect on your achievements and actually be proud of what you've done. I think a lot of times we're looking at the next step and we're just constantly like looking at the next thing that we want to achieve. And it's while it's great to be motivated and driven in our profession or in our field, like we're always wanting to strive and overachieve and everything, we rarely take the time to just look back and like admire or pat ourselves on the back for like what we have achieved. And I think it's important to do that because you realize like how far you've come through all this. And it's like, we, we go through a lot and I think you deserve to give yourself credit every now and then. Um, second thing I wanted to, or third thing I wanted to go over was mental health from pre dent to DMD, DDS. So from the very start, like wh while you guys are in pre dental to like now where I am, I think like focusing on your mental health is important. Like there's no gap or moment where it changes. It's just different ways of approaching it. So when you're in pre-dental, you're stressed about applica applications, you're stressed about DAT, you're stressed about all that stuff. So that really affects you. 
Then when you're in dental school, you're stressed about school, stressed about labs, stressed about wax ups, patients coming or showing up for your boards. So it like never ends. It's always, you're always going to be stressed. And I hate to like bring that up, but it's going to be a natural part of your dental career, but there's ways to handle it and there's ways to overcome it and also use it to your advantage. And I think, like I said, the first two things, like being in a good setting that you're really comfortable with and you enjoy being in really helps. And on top of that, being able to reflect on the things you have accomplished that give you motivation and confidence to achieve the next thing or the next challenge <clears throat> is important. Cause you know, like if you passed or if you did well in the DAT to me personally, that was the hardest test I ever took. I mean, after that, I was like, I can, I can take anything from here on out. And that's how I approach all my dental school tests and all my, you know, boards exams. I was like, if I already got through the DAT and got accepted in dental school, that was the hardest part. Now it's just like, just staying with it. You're basically running a marathon now and you just have to keep your pace. Um, and then the next thing is just finding balance. <clears throat> so like I said, um, you're going to go through a lot of stress. You're going to be constantly stressed out about stuff. So it's always important to find a balance between work and fun, like, you know, taking time off. So for me being in Chicago, my excuse was to just explore the city, try new restaurants, um, walk around, take photos. I really got into photography by being in Chicago. And, you know, at the time I had a girlfriend and it was nice to like just separate myself from dental school and enjoy, you know, um, being, in the amazing city for four years. So there was like moments when I could do that. And then when I was done with that, I could go back and focus in the school with a fresh new perspective. So I think you have to kind of figure out how you can dissociate yourself from dentistry sometimes, because if you get too caught up in it, it'll not only burn you out, but it'll turn your, turn you off from dentistry in general. You're going to associate it with negativity and you don't want that. You want to kind of set some kind of boundary. So like, even for me, like now that I'm off work, I sh shut down that, well, obviously now I'm talking about dentistry, that doesn't count. But usually when I come home from work, I like close off that um, aspect of my life. And then I just work out or I play video games or I watch movies or TV. Like I just try not to think about dentistry because if that's constantly in your head or if you're constantly worrying about a patient or something, it can definitely drag you down and just, you know, mentally exhaust you. Um, so that was my spiel about it. Um, I'll definitely bring up more later. And if you guys have more questions about it, but those are like my core principles of it is just trying to find the right balance and being in a good setting. Um, and next thing we'll do is go over a quick case with you guys. Uh, so I'll go to the next slide. <laughs> uh, just real quick, my education. So I went to the university of Texas here in Austin. Um, I did bio and business foundations and I loved both. I mean, I think you can do any major. Don't put yourself through bio if you don't want to. If you want to do anything else, literally anything else you can, just do the core principle, you know, things that you need. And yeah, I think taking anything will just give you more rounded um, background that can help with uh, your applications. Um, I did business foundation just because I thought that would be, you know, useful to have as a dentist now. And I think it has definitely helped, but there's definitely, you can never learn enough business stuff, especially with like our world, the way it's changing with social media and marketing and everything. So just keep that in mind. I think that's something to try to um, dedicate some of your learning towards because while knowing sciences and knowing dentistry is important, it's also important to know how to handle your finances and even your loans when you do get done with it. So try to think about all that stuff as early as possible because the earlier, the better for you. Um, I went to Midwestern University and mentioned that um, location. I love Chicago and I picked the tech that was at the school. So they used a lot of the latest technology that dentistry now has like CAT CAM machines um, <clears throat> and just like the latest like hand pieces and everything, which I thought was great because when I got out, it was a lot easier to adapt to new practices because a lot of them had that new tech. So I think if you go to older dental schools, unfortunately, some of them still have like really old tech and whatnot. And 
you can get really good at using that and then you graduate and then the office you go to has like some new tech. So it's like a learning curve you have to get used to. Um, but that's just my outlook on it. I think, you know, there's different ways to approach that. Um, just a tidbit, I worked at the Genius Bar at Apple uh, during my time off, which was amazing. And I think that to me um, carried over a lot into dentistry. I had to do a lot of people managing and, you know, giving bad news to people, charging them a lot of money. Um, people were scared to come to me. So I think there's like a lot of um, parallels between the two jobs. And I think if you can find a job that isn't dental related, but gives you some kind of qualities that you can attribute later on to dentistry, I think it's also good. Like working in retail in general is a great thing to do um, just because you learn how to be more of a people person and just like how to relate to people, talk to them, um, align with their expectations, stuff like that. I think that's like a big part of dentistry that people don't think about. Um, <clears throat> let's hold on to the next slide. Um, so just tidbit about what I currently do. I practice general and cosmetic dentistry in Austin right now. Um, I recently moved here as of two months ago. Um, I used to work at a lower income office where I did mostly like Medicare, Medicaid, Medicaid kind of uh, care. And so I was doing like a lot of extractions, root canals, but now I'm doing like, I'm still doing that stuff, but I'm doing also like veneers, crowns, stuff like that. So I moved here because another situation where I love the location, I love Austin. I wanted to be somewhere that made me happy. Um, so I was lucky enough to meet two guys that I really get along with and they own a couple of practices here and it just worked out. Um, so yeah, that's another thing is once you do practice, practice in a location that you want to practice and don't, don't lock yourself into something you're not passionate or, you know, in love with, especially location wise and also just people wise who you're working with. Um, so we'll go on to the next thing. Um, this is my practice. So if you're in, if you're in Austin and you want to stop by, um, I'm at enamel dentistry, uh, pick the office based on its reputation, owner's mindset and attitude, which aligned with me, which I think you guys need to also consider when you do work in an office, you really want to get along with not only like the, the owners, but you want to really align with like their ethics and overall personality, because that's going to be your personality too and it's basically like you're marrying into something someone and you want to get along with them just as much as they get along with you um so these are my factors that i mentioned that you know you should definitely think about um and that's something you can save later on i know you guys still need to go through dental school first but it's good to kind of keep this in mind for your future just because when you're interviewing in an office you have to remember that not only are they interviewing you, but you're also interviewing them as to whether you're the right fit for their practice. So that's something to always keep in mind. Like you have a lot of value to them. Um, so don't ever feel like you're out there buying for a job because if anything, you're a really valuable person once you have that degree and people are fighting to get you. So you need to really show your value and also interview the people that are or ask, don't be afraid to ask them questions that, you know, that you want to know whether it fits for you. Um, <clears throat> let me see if I mentioned anything specifically. Yeah. So just an ex example, uh, my first six months graduating out of dental school, I went straight into a corporate office just because that was the easiest job to get. Uh, they had a guarantee pay and I was like, okay, I'll just do this and take advantage of it. And it was awful. I hated it. Um, I didn't ask the right questions when I first applied. Um, I was very much led the wrong, misled into like the culture of the office and it just ended up not being a fun time for me. Um, so that was just a learning lesson for me. And that's why I made basically my own chart of questions that I asked every office after that when I was applying. And so if the time comes and you guys need that PowerPoint uh, question chart, just let me know and I'll be happy to, uh, send that your way. So we'll go on to the next thing. Okay. Um, so just how a regular day for me starts off, uh, I would say 
what we usually start off with is a morning huddle, which you'll, you'll probably do in dental school too. Uh, it's basically you review the charts, you review your patients with the assistants and the staff, and you just kind of figure out what your day is going to be like. Uh, and then we discuss any cases that might be um, complicated or any opportunities to grow or improve. Like let's say a patient had a bad experience last time or if they're nervous or anything like that, how we can approach it. Um, once I go into my office after that, I call patients for follow-up treatments. Um, like if I did a crown on a patient the day before, I'll just call up and see how they're doing. If I did an extraction, I'll see if they're feeling okay. And I think a simple thing like that in dentistry goes such a long way. Like just a patient knowing that you call them the next day to check in on them is huge. So there's, um, that's another part, like I mentioned, is that people aspect of dentistry is such a huge thing and you really want to um, keep that in kind of like the center of your mentality when you're um, practicing dentistry is that you're working on human beings and you're taking care of human beings and you want to treat them as such. So just like your mom, if you did, you know, some work on your mom, you'd want to check on her the next day. Uh, same thing with these patients. Um, after that, I review my schedule, change any codes. Just remember as a dentist, everything's under your license. So if anything's wrong, it's going to be held on your license. So it's a lot of responsibility, um, but also it's a good way for you to just kind of keep on top of things. So you always just want to be very um, strict about uh, how things are handled with your staff. Um, don't let your staff write your notes. Don't let your assistants write your notes, write your own notes, because if something goes wrong, God forbid, the judge isn't going to ask you what the assistant wrote. They're going to ask what you wrote or like, you know, what happened. And if you are like, Oh, it was the assistant's fault. They did this or that. It's not going to slide. It's going to be all on you and your license. So that's something to keep in mind. Um, I review medical history and new patients coming procedures, same thing. You just want to, you know, cover all your tracks and make sure or cover up your ground and make sure that you're never put in a situation where something unexpected happens. Like if a patient is on blood thinners, you don't want to walk in the room and do an extraction and not know that. So just remember <clears throat> dentistry is a lot of like attention to detail. That's why dentists in general are known as like class class A type people, or is it class A? What do they call it? Type one, type A, type one type people. Um, so yeah, we're, we're anal for a reason because every little detail matters, not only in like your design of your filling or crown, but also in like patient information. You want to know like every little detail about your patient for your own safety and for theirs. Um, and then finally I go over my Invisalign cases, which I've been doing a lot of as of lately because of this new office which is awesome. So if you guys get an opportunity to get more into Invisalign, I think it's worth learning because that's basically the future of dentistry in terms of like, not only aesthetics, but like occlusion and bite and everything like that. So there's a lot of ways you can really improve yourself through Invisalign. Um, so yeah, we'll go to the next slide. Uh, mental health again, I'm just gonna kind of keep bringing up certain things. Um, first question, most important, and that some of you can still consider because you still have time is, are you doing it for you? Um, so I know like in, you know, in my culture and a lot of people's cultures, like being a doctor, a lawyer, being like in that field is so important, but like, is it really what you want? That's something that you really want to consider and think about. And I think I am guilty of getting into it because of like my culture and expectations of that, but I'm also lucky that I really fell in love with it once I got into it. And I, um, you know, I did have like certain aspects that I love, like the artistic aspect of it and the creative approach. Um, but you know, that, that can only take you so far if you, if you aren't fully invested in it. Um, and I do have friends that are in it that now realize they, they weren't fully into it and it's, not great because it's hard to get <clears throat> it's hard to get out of it just because you put so much into it and you put so much money so much mental energy so much time into it that like it's only it's only um the logical thing to do would just be to keep doing it unless you found something else that like is obviously way more successful or you can pay off your loan to move on to something else which i do have a friend that did that and she owns a business now and she can not do dentistry ever again and she'll be fine. But, you know, those are very rare situations. So that's the first thing that's really important is you really want to 
sit down with yourself and ask yourself. Don't ask anybody else. Don't ask your mom or dad. Don't ask your friends. Just ask yourself, like, is this what I want to do? And will I be happy doing it? Um, a lot, you know, do you see yourself in it for the right reasons? Are you in it for the money? Are you in it for uh, wanting to treat patients? Like, what what is it that drives you to want to be in the profession? And do you feel like it's going to actually make you want to wake up and get out of bed every morning doing it? Um, and just remember dentistry is ongoing. Like you, it, you know, there was a time when dentists would retire at the age of 40 and be happy, but unfortunately that's not the case anymore. Um, and a lot of dentists work till like, I don't know, till they can't work anymore. So just remember, is it something that you want to keep doing your whole life? Um, and will you be okay with that kind of sacrifice? Cause you know, it's definitely physically demanding. It's mentally demanding. Um, it's a great profession, but I just like, I think it's one of those professions that really requires passion and, um, a lot of dedication. So sorry to get down into that part, but I mean, I think I, I wish somebody told me this too, because I never really sat down with myself and asked myself that until I was in dental school, which I think by that time was too late, but you know, I think it's an important conversation to have with yourself. Um, so we'll go on to the next slide <clears throat> so these are my mental health rules i just made up randomly but i think they help um just take moments like i said to reflect and congratulate yourself um take breaks when you can take vacations you definitely need to treat yourself because you're going to be in this profession for a long time you put yourself through so much already so whenever you get a chance to like spoil yourself if you can because you deserve it like it's there's no going around how much we go through. So just think about that. Um, the other thing is never compete. So in dental school, like, you know, we end up being in a school full of like, literally everyone else in the class is the same, the same as you in that they pushed themselves to their, you know, their limit to get to a certain place. And they were the top performers in like most of their undergrad. And so now they're in a, in a, small room with what 60 70 other people who are in the same regard so the best thing to do is to work together and kind of build camaraderie between everyone and not compete uh and i think like the first emotion we get is like oh i, I have to be better than everyone else here i have to like succeed but in dentistry it's not like that i think the more you compete the more you close yourself off from other dentists, the less successful you're going to be. And that's just because you're not going to learn things that you never would have learned about. Like, and I get patient referrals from dental friends. I get free CE courses from friends. Like, I think if I didn't build up this camaraderie and friendship with friends, and if I competed, I would have never had these other resources given to me by them. So I think the more, um, the more of a network you build, the more relationships you build, the more you'll get out of it as a dentist. So try not to be competitive. It's good to be competitive with yourself and to want to always strive to do better. But if you're competitive with your uh, classmates and people around you, then it's it's going to have a detrimental effect on you. Um, so that's another thing, just help your neighbors. Uh, if you do, it'll, it'll always come around somehow, whether it's through patients or other stuff. Um, the other thing is be social. So a lot of dentistry is just, talking to people, whether you're talking to your assistants, whether you're talking to your uh, patients, whether you're talking to other dentists, you're always like communicating, being social and networking. So I think a lot of our time is spent studying in the library for so long that you, you can definitely lose that social aspect. And just remember, patients don't really give, they don't care if you're the best dentist in your state. And if you do the most beautiful fillings, what they care about is whether you make them feel comfortable when they're in that dental chair. So <clears throat> it doesn't matter how aesthetic your stuff is. If you're the most awkward dentist that they've ever met in their life and you can't hold a conversation with them, they're going to go to the next dentist who can tell the most amazing jokes and uh, best stories, but they make the crappiest feelings. But it's like, you know, they won't care to that much because they won't even be able to see it most of the time. And not only that, but like they would just feel more comfortable going to an office where they they don't get dental trauma or dental anxiety. Um, the other thing is surround yourself with people you love, places you love, 
and things like pets. <clears throat> so I think that's always just, you know, a constant thing I'm going to mention. Uh, just try to be around things that kind of take your mind off the industry when you need it and um, kind of help you in a positive way of growing and, you know, staying positive in whatever regard you can. Uh, so I'll go on to the next slide. Uh, so this is the case of the day. Uh, so this is my first day working at this office, actually. So I had a 26-year-old male came in for a limited exam. He had pain in the upper right. It was a throbbing, continuous pain that left him unable to sleep. Uh, so we took antral roll pictures. We took a PA, a bite wing, and um, this is basically what we got. So obviously you can see his tooth is pretty broken down. Um, that's the buccal aspect. So that's like the facial part of the tooth, pretty broken down. And then on the x-ray, you can't really see the decay as much, but you can actually see his root and how long his root is. So, I mean, I immediately knew that it was going to be a little bit of a challenging extraction, um, but it needed to come out regardless because it was basically a wisdom tooth that he wasn't using to chew with. And usually when you see wisdom teeth broken down like that, um, you don't ever want to do fillings on wisdom teeth because they're never going to use them they're not useful. He's still pretty young, so it's always good to just get this tooth out so he doesn't have to worry about it down the road. Um, so, like I said, the root was pretty long. You can kind of see the sinus floor at the root tips, and that's always something to be concerned about because if the roots extend into the sinus, then when you extract the tooth, there's always a high chance that the sinus can be exposed. So that's something to always take into consideration. Um, I don't know who has a mouse, but if you can just kind of point at that dark area by the root, uh, go up to the roots on the right side. And yeah, see like that dark space, that's basically like the sinus floor. So um, that was definitely something I wanted to kind of be aware of. Uh, so you can go on to the next slide. So just to give you a heads up, these are the extraction tools that we typically use. So on the left side, we have the elevators and on the bottom right, those are forceps. So usually based on what I've learned and based on a lot of oral surgeons I know, you typically always just want to focus on the elevators first. Uh, and forceps are mostly just there for like that very last like extraction where you're just basically taking out a mobile tooth. So the elevators kind of help with the most important part, which is breaking the PDL fibers, loosening the tooth out of the socket and basically elevating it like the board says out of the socket. The forceps are more there to kind of have um, a grasp on it so it doesn't fall out or, you know, go full to the back of their throat or whatever. Uh, forceps can definitely be used by themselves, but it's not recommended just because there's such a high risk of breaking the tooth or fracturing the root tip. Um, and that's just a pain because once you break the tooth and the root tip stuck in there, then you have to, you know, it adds more time to your procedure. It's a pain for you. It's a pain for the patient. So it's always better if you can just elevate it out um, rather than using the forceps. And I, I used to use the forceps a lot in dental school because I was like, oh, this is way easier to just hold it and then move it around and whatnot. But once you really get the handle of using elevators, it's like a game changer. So when you're in dental school, just try to force yourself to use elevators as much as you can, and you'll definitely be thankful for it when, once you get out. Um, just adds up elevators function to elevate the tooth out of the socket um, through applying pressure and breaking the PDL fibers. Um, always use elevator. That's my old surgeon who is badass um, Russian woman who is really good at it, all oral surgery. Um, forceps used to grasp, I already mentioned that different elevators serve different functions. So just to give you a heads up, those root elevators, the criers, um, you see how they're a different shape. They're kind of a pointy shape. So that's basically the pointy shape is just so once you get into the socket, let's say there's just a root tip in there, you kind of go in there and that you just kind of rotate it until it kind of latches onto the root tip and you're just basically kind of driving it out of the socket with like your rotation of your wrist. So you're not really like you're not like, you know, leveraging it out or using it like a lever. You're more like rotating it and elevating it using the curvature of the four, um, the elevators. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. It's a lot of like wrist movement rather than like whole arm movement. Um, so we'll go on to the next side slide. So 
this is the procedure. Uh, these aren't the photos, but they're pretty similar just because I didn't take photos during the whole procedure. Um, but this is pretty much exactly what happened. So I extracted it using those elevators I mentioned before. I go up in size usually. So I start small and then I go bigger as you're getting more mobility. Uh, and they're wider elevators as you go up in size, which makes it just, you rotate it less, but you get more movement because it's just a wider uh, diameter. Um, <clears throat> elevator is wedged between the tooth until a purchase point is achieved. The pur purchase point is basically like a point you reach on the tooth where the elevator just kind of locks. And then you're basically just rotating your arm. And then it's kind of like, it's kind of like an anchor point on the tooth. And then you're just rotating it out without, um, it shifting around or anything. Um, so I rotated it mesially. So mesially and distally, you guys will learn about that. Obviously, mesially is toward the center midline of your mouth. So any tooth that's located, like if you ever say mesial, you're kind of talking about things that are like towards the midline. Distal is anything that's um, away from the midline of your mouth. So that's just a good way to remember it. Um, the long root obviously provided a challenge uh, upon extraction. Um, there was a sinus exposure. So what you can see on that left side is basically you can see the sinus membrane, which is that light tissue. And then there's bone around that site. Um, but usually <clears throat> when you get sinus exposure, if you ask the patient to breathe through the nose, that little membrane is not going to move in and out. It's just going to kind of like stay still because of air is just going back and forth through that hole. Um, but if the membrane is still intact, you'll actually see it kind of going in and out, kind of like a balloon, like when you blow it in, in and out, same thing will happen with that sinus membrane. Um, so luckily when I pulled the tooth out, I did see the sinus membrane, but the membrane was still in, intact. There was no hole. Uh, I made him do a little breathing technique and I noticed that the, the sinus was moving. There was no problem. So um, there was no oriental communication. So that was great super happy about that um so once i figured out it was intact i took a collagen plug which is basically like like the word says it's a collagen plug uh it kind of looks like a cotton roll and you just put it in a little site obviously i irrigated it and cleaned out the socket first um very gently just to make sure i didn't puncture the membrane um rinsed it with saline and then put the collagen plug in there and then did a suture um and <clears throat> when you do the cross suture, it just kind of helps the membrane stay in place or lets the collagen plug stay in place and nothing else gets in there. Uh, I went over post-op instructions with them just to kind of make sure, you know, they were aware that there was a sinus membrane exposure, uh, that they shouldn't spit or smoke or anything that can actually cause any further complications with that. I didn't have to prescribe them antibiotics or anything like that, but... I just had a basically a three day post op just to follow up and see if he was doing okay because he was a 26 year old kid so I was wanted to make sure he actually followed his directions. Um, so yeah, we'll go into the next slide. Oh yeah, so that's it. Um, hopefully that was an interesting case for y'all. Sorry, I went over a lot of mental health stuff, so I figured I'd show like one interesting case to show, prove that I actually do dentistry. So. Um, yeah, you guys have any questions? Go for it. Sure. Um, first of all, thank you so much. Um, I definitely loved hearing about the mental health portion of this presentation because I feel like it's not discussed enough in dentistry. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. For sure. Um, so yeah, we do have some questions from um, our Instagram and um, YouTube as well. I actually have a question about the case you had just discussed. So like, okay. God forbid, if the sinus, um, if something did happen to that, what would be like the protocol from there? Like if that ever um, happened? Um, there's a lot you have to do, um, which off the top of my head, it's, so it depends on the size of the exposure, uh, because if there's, it's, there's basically like a limit to what you need to do. And that's more of an oral surgery type question. But, um, if you do get a sinus exposure, you have to go through this whole, like, sinus exposure protocol and you have to prescribe them antibiotics. You have to go over 
things they can't do when they're at home. Like they can't, you know, um, build up any pressure. So they, if they have to sneeze or anything, they have to be very careful. Um, and then also you have to basically plug up that um, area just to make sure nothing gets in there, nothing causes any further complications. So, yeah, I mean, a lot of times, too, if it is a really big sinus exposure, you also may have to refer it to an oral surgeon to get it checked out, and then you have to do further stuff to it. Um, but I've been thankful enough to not have one yet. Um, this is the closest I got to it. And in these cases, it's pretty straightforward in that you just want to make sure the membrane is still uh, intact, and then, uh, yeah, just kind of go from there. Awesome, thank you. Um, also, kind of like, uh, I guess going off of that, like if there ever is a situation where, like, especially for a new dentist, if you're not sure about like a procedure or something, who can you reach out to for help, like in a work setting? Um, so, in a work setting, are you saying for me as a dentist, who to reach out to if I need help? Yeah, either for you or like for a new dentist that's just coming into the work field. So when I graduated, I was lucky enough to like have a few dental instructors from dental school that I was close with and they all gave me their cell phone numbers and they were just like, anytime you need anything or have questions, just text us. And I feel like for the most part, most dental students have that when they first graduate, they have that one professor they got along with. Um, so like I had that oral surgeon lady who like I still talk to and hang out with when I'm in Chicago, which is cool because now we're like, she calls like she tells me not to call her dr swan just call her her name because like she considers me uh uh associate now not like a like a friend rather than a student so i think like once you graduate dental school not only do you have like your professors and stuff that you can really relay stuff from but you also have like you know your the big brothers or big sisters above you so like the people who graduated before you because they now have had a year under their belt um and they can help you if you ever need uh, the other thing is you know with social media now luckily it's so easy to build a network of dentist friends and i have a couple i've been lucky to get close enough with now that anytime i have questions i literally can just dm one of my instagram dentist friends and they'll have an answer for me like whether it's about orthodontics or uh, endo or anything like that so I think that's where it comes to that whole thing of not being competitive. I think if you're competitive, obviously, if you don't help anyone, they're not going to want to help you when you need it. So just try to always lend a helping hand when you can, and it'll always come back to you when you need it. Awesome. Thank you. Um, now, like, taking a step back to, like, your undergrad years, what do you think, like, you did, like, with extracurriculars or stuff that helped you in your dental application in, when you were applying? Well, I definitely think working at Apple was a huge plus for me because every interview I had, uh, people thought that was fascinating and it was like a fun thing to talk about because everybody has iPhone issues. And so that would come up during interviews. And I think I also played soccer during undergrad. And I think being in sports or any kind of physical activity helps just to show that you're well-rounded. You're not only just like in the library, but you have time to discipline be disciplined in another sense. So like being in sports is a good way to show your sense of discipline and work ethic. Um, I think obviously being involved in stuff like this is awesome now because you can show you have that extra tenacity to like get through the pandemic and COVID and figure out a way around it by like doing this instead of going to dental offices to shadow. So I think there's so many ways you can show your strengths now and it doesn't just have to be through like extracurriculars at school you can also show like how you're building your social media or how you're building your your presence in different ways so just try to show how you're creative and i think that'll also help like tremendously awesome thank you um then once you eventually got into dental school what was like the most shocking thing for you like it was definitely obviously hard but like what was something you didn't expect but like happened if that makes sense um, I, um, I mean, I definitely did not, I knew it was going to be hard, but I didn't expect it to be that challenging in terms of like, I literally had an exam every week on Monday. And so I learned that I basically learned how I, 
they pushed me to my limit. I, it's like I did stuff that I never realized I could do. Like the amount of material I could learn within a weekend was crazy to me because these exams would be like kind of like, you know, in undergrad, these would be like our final exams for a whole semester, but we would be taking these every week. So the amount of material I learned that I could absorb in like a short amount of time was really what shocked me. Um, but not only that, just my, my ability as a human being, like work ethic wise was really pushed. And I, I love that personally, because I feel like that dental school is probably the most challenging four years of my life in a rewarding way. Like I'm proud of like, no, like knowing that I got through dental school is the most proud thing to me because it shows like, that, um, yeah, I was able to just accomplish something that was really challenging. And I think that's something that you guys should look forward to. I know it sounds scary, but like, it's just imagine knowing that you're going to be like pushed to your limit and you're going to be able to achieve it and be successful from it. I think that's like an amazing thing because not everyone's had the luck to be pushed to their limit in their life. And I think that's like something that a lot of people miss out on. Thank you. Um, okay, so kind of going off of that, um, as far as like study habits go, this is kind of like a two part question. But as far as study habits go, how do you think it changed from undergrad to dental school? And like, since in dental school, you have to learn so much. How did you find yourself the best methods to retain um, like the extensive amount of information? Um, <clears throat> in undergrad, I mean, I barely studied in undergrad and I got by. I think not to say I didn't study, but I, when I did, it would be like, okay, two days in the library and then I can just cram everything and I'll be good to go. Whereas with dental school, I feel like you can do that, but it's not beneficial in the long run because you're going to have to know this stuff for boards or you're going to have to know this stuff. Like, like it's not like I can just cram this stuff and forget it. Like I'm actually going to need to know this stuff when I'm doing stuff later on. So um, my study habits in dental school were, uh, I would record lectures. I would go to lectures. Sometimes I wouldn't go and my girlfriend would record them, which wasn't like, don't take that um, advice. But recording them is important because for me, I was like an auditory learner and a visual learner. So like I always liked being able to listen while writing notes. So I would replay the notes while like writing additional stuff. And I would rewrite my notes. And then I would review my notes like both the original ones and the rewritten ones. And um, I would then listen to it and then just review it while listening to it. So I think everybody has their own way of doing it, but I think the most important thing is just figuring out your most effective study habit and then sticking to it and just basically like practice, like with sports, you just get better at it over time and you perfect it to a certain level. So like once you perfect your study habit, you can just keep reusing it and redoing it. Um, so I think that's the most important thing is figuring out like, how do you study best? and like, how do you retain information the best? Because some people like to listen to music when they study. Some people don't. Some people like to study at the library. Some people don't. Some people like to study in coffee shops. I, I tried to, but it's like distracting. So that's the most important thing is like, um, once you refine that, then it should be pretty straightforward. Awesome. Thank you. Um, so the next question kind of has to do with eventually getting into like the lab and like hands on portion of dental school. And once you started that, what did you think was the hardest part about that? And then how did you see like growth within like the hands on experience within dental school, if that makes sense? Um, so I was I think that was my strong suit was working with my hands like I was better at that than I was with the book aspect of it. Um, and I think that's like also an important part of dental school is like, if you're not good at one or the other, like try to really focus on getting better at it. Um, but yeah, I mean, the hand part to me was an easy thing to kind of acclimate to because I used to do art a lot and I used to I work on things with my hands. So like for me, it was like an easy transition. Even working at Apple, like I fix things with my hands a lot and stuff. So for me, tactile stuff was like an easy transition. Um, and I think 
I did have friends that like that was really tough. Like some of them were really incredibly book smart, but like they couldn't do a filling and pass with like all their sh- might, you know. And so I think that's just something you have to work at and figure out how to get around it uh, because that's unfortunately like a huge part of dentistry. And if you don't get better at that, it's not going to help you in the long run. I mean, a lot of our tests are based on our hand skills. So like, you know, you get graded on your fillings and you get graded on um, doing like certain types of fillings and they, they're super strict on like how the outcome of that filling should be. And it's on a live patient. Like first time it's on a mannequin, then it's on a live patient and that just adds to it because not only now are you dealing with like trying to make that perfect feeling, but you're also working on a person who's like uh, anxious, nervous, or, you know, there's saliva everywhere. So it's like, it's a lot of stuff. And that's where it comes back to like, you're going to be challenged to your limit. Um, and if you think like this is challenging, the next thing is going to be way more challenging. And then the next, more, next thing is going to be even more challenging. And so you just have to like, focus on each task in the moment and try to get better at that. Um, so my advice for that, I guess, like, is it, if you're not good hand skill wise, you're going to have to dedicate a lot of time to stay there after school hours to work on it. And the labs are always open. Like they basically give you a key card and you can be there anytime you need to, to work on your stuff. And I've had, I've been there sometimes till like nine or 10 at night till later, just working on like, you know, a filling, shape or size or whatever so uh doing wax ups on teeth and stuff like i've been there till late working on stuff and that's just part of it okay thank you um now like obviously with dentistry like the like the science part and like the dental part is very important also patient interaction is important and i feel like a lot of times that kind of gets forgotten for especially pre-dental students so what are some tips to like improve patient like care when you're like starting um within the work field um i think just building conversational habits i think like even like like this just having conversations with people uh talking to your friends i think like if you can talk to your patient like you would your friend but like obviously there's a professional kind of balance between that but you, the whole point of it is you want to make the patient feel like comfortable around you because a lot of the time, the majority of the patients are scared of you or they're traumatized from past dental experience. So your job is to realign them to be comfortable, not only around you, but to feel like they trust you like they would a friend or a close member. Right. Um, so I think the very challenging part of dentistry is like learning how to be a more people's person and, And not only that, but like um, knowing how to communicate with them as a human and not a doctor too, because sometimes, you know, you can't be like, you need a buckle composite and a class four, whatever, like every, you have to really explain it in simple terms to them. And you have to explain why it's important to them um, and why they need it. Because we're not like other doctors where we can just say, Hey, you have cancer and you need chemo. Like, then patients just say, okay, yes, let's do it. Like with us, we have to actually kind of sell our patients onto why they need stuff because some people don't value their teeth as much as others, right? So um, I think you have to learn not only to communicate and make them trust you, but you have to make them feel comfortable enough to do stuff with you without feeling like they're being sold or, you know, like, like you don't want to be a salesman. You want to be like a human being healthcare provider for them. Um, and that just takes practice. I feel like, I can't really tell you like what class to take or what CE to take for that. That's just about being like a human being and being a genuine person who cares for that patient. And that's just something, like I said, you have to know why you're going into the profession for the right reasons, because that will all play into whether you can do that with patients and patients can read when you're being authentic or not. So just keep that in mind. Awesome. Thank you. Um, our next question has to do, you had mentioned prior that you worked in the corporate job when, right, when you came out of dental school. So for you personally or in general, what, what was the biggest difference from a corporate job to then a private office? Um, I think that can differ for everyone. Um, for me, the big corporate thing I did that was tough for me to adapt to was the structure of it. It was very like everything was like written out for you, how to talk to patients, how to walk them to the back, what to say, 
uh, what types of treatments you should try to do instead of this tri- treatment. It's, it was very like structured. And for me as a healthcare provider, I didn't think that was right or fair because at the end of the day, like I'm the doctor and I should dictate like what the patient needs. Right. And I just felt like a lot of it was cookie cutter and focused on, um, focused on getting most of the most money out of the patient, which I didn't agree with. And there were some treatments I just didn't think, like I felt like a lot of the treatments were aggressive. And I was just ethically, I didn't feel comfortable there. Um, and so that's what deterred me away from it. But I don't think all corporate practices like that are like that, but I think a majority of them are. And for that reason, I like will never support corporate in that regard. So sorry, you know, like if anybody here has family in corporate or whatever, I don't think they're all bad, but I think I just like local, you know, local anything I like would rather support local than I would big corporations because at the end of the day, I feel like their, um, their motive at the end of the day is just profit and not really the human need. Uh, and it's unfortunate because that's where our world is going with everything. Uh, but if we can retain private practices and all that, I think those are always great because they're owned by people who genuinely love the profession or want to do well in it, um, or treat the patient well and i think that's where i find the most important industry so So thank you um so in general like speaking in general what do you think are some of the top challenges facing dentists today um just from like a general scope uh definitely student debt i just think student debt is like ridiculous and i think it's a joke that like we deal with so much in our day and age, especially because it's like, it's kind of like we're being punished for wanting more education and like wanting to treat people. Um, so I'm very jaded about that. Uh, probably not the best person to talk to about that. Cause I get very like upset about it. And I think it sucks because it deters people from wanting to be a dentist and deters people from wanting to be doctors. Um, and that's, that's like my biggest, uh, driving point um i think another deterrent is just like the competitiveness competitiveness of the field uh which i think is good to a certain regard because you know like you really have to fight to get into this field and when you fight and get into it you kind of know that you earned it because you you put so much of yourself through this and you um you know you were the top whatever percentage we are of people that apply it so that's something to congratulate yourself for. Um, but it is a downside because it, you know, I feel like some people just had strokes of bad luck where they just maybe got too anxious or too nervous and didn't do as well. So that's always unfortunate. Um, but yeah, I'd say, um, student debt is like the shittiest part of all of this. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so what kind of advice do you have? Cause obviously it's very hard undergrad, like even right now as an undergrad, it's very hard. So I can't even imagine that the school, but like along the way, like people do fail and there is hardship. So what is like some of the best advice for somebody to kind of, who is passionate about the dental field, but is having these struggles to kind of keep going um, on that path? Uh, I mean, I failed. Uh, I didn't get in to dental school or I didn't get, yeah, I didn't get accepted when I first applied. Um, I got waitlisted when I applied again, and then I got accepted my third time. Um, and then I failed my second boards um, towards the end of dental school. And I retook that. And so you're going to fail. Like, that's inevitable. You're going to fail something, whether it's a test, whether it's a wax up, whether it's a practical exam whatever you're going to feel like it's inevitable, but it's just a matter of like how you pick yourself up and kind of keep going. And you're going to fail in dentistry too. Like I've had patients that, you know, the outcomes weren't great, but you just keep moving because you're not going to do perfect on every patient. There's going to be patients that are upset no matter what you do for them. You're going to get a bad Google review at some point that counts as a failure because you didn't treat that patient as you would hope to. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, like, if you can't handle failure now, 
then you're going to have a tough time getting through dental school and you're going to have a tough time getting through dentistry because dentistry is full of failures. Like no dentist is perfect in his practice. And so um, I think that's the most important thing is like, like I said, you're going to be challenged the most. And it's because I've never failed so much in like a span of four years and something, but like, I'm so thankful that I failed all those times because not only did it like mentally strengthen me for like anything, like now when I fail stuff, I'm just like, all right, let's just do it again. Or let's just go on it. Like, it's like, this isn't the worst failure I've had. I've had much worse things happen. And so I think it like strengthened me and it also just kind of, it sounds bad, but it like desensitized me to all that stuff. So I don't feel like, I don't feel anything in that regard. I just keep moving. I'm like, take a sleep over. Whereas in undergrad, you know, if you fail a test in undergrad, it's like, Oh my God, the world's going to end. I'm not going to get dental school, but like, you'll be fine. Like if you, as long as you just keep moving and show that you're persistent and you have tenacity, I think you'll be fine. Thank you. I think we have time for one or two questions. We'll see how it goes. But um, the next question has to do with like technology. And I know you mentioned that you do like love technology, but as far as dental technology goes, like where do you see it going within like the next 10 years or so? Um, I mean, I think a lot of dental tech is going to go towards like cloud-based systems, which is cool. Cause I think like being in a, being in a position now where there's multiple offices, it'd be nice to be able to like move from office to office and have the patient's records and everything on a cloud based system. So you can access it from anywhere. Um, obviously it'd be nice to be able to access it from my phone, but I know like for HIPAA reasons that might be hard. But, um, the other thing I think is like 3d technology, like 3d printing. I think that's going to be like the next thing. So like dental labs might be replaced now. Like for instance, we do all of our stuff scanning. We don't take impressions anymore. So we scan everyone's arch. Um, so I think it's cool that like, I can tell a patient like, hey, you need a night card. We're gonna scan you right now and we'll have your impression here. And like, they don't have to deal with the goopy stuff going in their mouth. If I have like gagger patients who hate stuff getting in their throat, they don't have to deal with that. And I love how like accurate it is that I can pull it up on this big screen and I can go over it with my patient and kind of show them what's going on on their teeth and they, we can both visualize it. And I think it's not only helped me be able to visualize it with the patient, but it increased my treatment planning uh, success rate because patients now are able to be like, oh my God, like my gums look horrible or my teeth look horrible and like, oh, this, this is how my teeth will look before and after Invisalign. Like there's an algorithm that I can actually show your before and after teeth alignment, which is cool. So I think like technology and that scope of like uh, digital um, impression and digital remodeling of things is really cool. And just being able to print it or make an actual crown out of a digital printer, um, that's the future of dentistry. And I think it's cool because we're definitely already at that stage. It's just a matter of refining it now and making it more accessible to more dentists. Awesome. Uh, I think that's all the time we have today, but I just want to say thank you so much once again for coming um, onto our YouTube channel and for all the amazing advice, especially the mental health part. I think it's very important and I really appreciate that you did mention that. Um, yeah, that's all. Thanks. Thank you again. Cool. Thank you for having me and uh, thanks for doing this. You guys are awesome and Good luck to everyone who's applying this cycle or next cycle. Sorry you guys are dealing with COVID right now, but uh, hopefully it'll be over soon and you guys can get back to normal life. But yeah, these are my socials. If you guys want to ask me any more questions or reach out at any point, uh, I'm not the best at email, but I'm probably better at Instagram. So if you send me a DM or something, I can always look through it. Um, but yeah, good luck with everything. And uh, 